<clears throat> Welcome, comadres and friends. I am Dr. Nora de Hoyos Comstock, national and international founder of Las Comadres para las Americas. The leadership team and I are pleased to have you join us for tonight's teleconference as we celebrate our book club's quinceañero. It has been our privilege to support Latino authors throughout these many years, and we look forward to the next 15 years with you and your friends. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome to readers following us on our live Twitter chat. Tonight, please help us welcome authors Angie Cruz and Daniel Jose Older. Their interviews will begin shortly. But before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Please keep yourselves on mute. And you may keep your videos on, but do not have a lot of distracting motions. We suggest you put yourself on speaker mode, but gallery works just as well. If you wanna see everybody, gallery is better. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and we will try to get to them. Oops. I, sorry, I, my script went away. Uh, we will try to get to them. Uh, but first let's start with our book club's history. Comadre Tess, would you? Hi everyone, I'm, Te I'm Tess Tobin. First, um, <clears throat> some, excuse me, submissions coordinator for the book club. Um, our first book club gathering was in July, 2004 in New York in Comadre Maria Ferrer's apartment. After our hiatus, Nora Comstock re-envisioned and relaunched the book club nationwide to promote the work of Latino authors to every book lover, to bring our community to bookstores and to support our writers. We started our teleconferences in October of 2006. We are in our 15th year of sharing works by Latino authors with all of you. We, we created the teleconferences and book clubs to entice everyone to read more Latino authors, to learn about Latino roots and the different perspectives on Latino culture and heritage. Our book club and teleconferences are open to all, not just Latinos. We are creating a space for everyone to explore the Latino writer's mind and soul as portrayed through the written word. We encourage you to join our local club in your city or time zone. We have clubs in 12 cities that are meeting virtually and now some in person. There is sure to be one that can fit your schedule. If your city doesn't have one, why don't you help us start one? For more information about our book club, visit our website at latinolit.com. So please invite others to join us. Comadre Karen. Welcome comadres and friends to our December 2022 Zoom teleconference. This is Karen Gonzalez, Assistant Coordinator for the Las Comadres and Friends Book Club, Denver Comadres Book Club Facilitator and Co-Founder of the Colorado Alliance of Latino Mentors and Authors. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight we begin with our interview with author Angie Cruz, a novelist and editor. How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water is her fourth novel. Her third novel, Dominicana, was the inaugural book pick for the GMA Book Club and chosen as the 2019-2020 Word Up Uptown Reads. Cruz is the author of two other novels, Soledad and Let It Rain Coffee, and the recipient of numerous fellowships and residencies. She's the founder and editor-in-chief of the award-winning literary journal, Asterix, and is currently an associate professor at University of Pittsburgh. She divides her time between Pittsburgh, New York, and Turin. Interviewing Angie is Comadre Lydia Galvan, a native Texan and proud descendant of Spanish settlers who have been ranching in South Texas since the 1750s. Her ancestors arrived in Mexico in the 1530s as conversos, Jewish families who converted to Catholicism and were forced to immigrate to the New World to escape the Spanish Inquisition. They were among the first settlers in Saltillo, Mexico. Lydia is a semi-retired after a successful 43-year career as a healthcare executive. Comadre Lydia, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Angie, what a pleasure to get to speak with you and to interview you. I'm one of your biggest fans. I have to tell you before <laughs> I go any further. Um, <clears throat> 
I love this book because initially the, pre the premise seems so simple, but it's so deep. It's wonderful. Uh, for those who have not read How to Drown with a Glass of Water, could you give us just a quick synopsis of the high points? Yeah, so I just wanna show everyone the book, um, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water. It's about a woman who is 56 years old and has been um, laid off from working at a factory that she's been working at in 25 years and forced to restart her life again. And the novel is told in 12 job counseling sessions where she's supposed to be training to get a job, but instead she tells her life story um, prompted by questions like, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your dreams? And her responses have to do with her family history, how she got to the United States, her struggle in her community, gentrification. So, um, and also her estrangement from her son. It was very enjoyable. As someone who's been through therapy, it kind of felt a little bit like therapy. And I know she was, if I were the person on the other end, she would be so much fun to be meeting with in those <laughs> sessions. Uh, why the title, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water? Well, it's interesting you say therapy, you know. Um, I think that for a lot of people in the community I grew up with, going to therapy, therapy was a taboo, like, or something that most people would never consider. And I started thinking about alternative therapies, like how do we get therapy outside of what we call therapy, right? And a lot of that happens in um, tarot card readings, you know, drinking coffee and letting people desahogarse. We have a word, as you know, in, I don't know, in Dominican Republic, it's used a lot, but I think in other parts of Latin America as well, el desahogo is to allow space for the other person to cry until they don't have to cry anymore or to talk until they don't have to talk about something, usually a loss or grief. And, um, and I thought, what would it look like if she had an opportunity for the first time ever in her life? I mean, you know, the truth is that a lot of um, the women I know um, who grew up, and even now actually, who are working to survive, have so many jobs, right? Those that they have in their home, those that they have to pay the rent, um, that they don't actually ever stop or can stop to actually think about all the things that have happened to in their lives. And in some ways being laid off and being forced to have these sessions where she has what I call an exquisite listener, her job counselor, she's able to just sit and really think about her life. With this woman, right? Um, there's also this um, saying, and I don't know if any of you use it, but it's, um, no te ahogues un vaso de agua. Don't drown in a glass of water. You know, and this is something that was told to me for a lot of a lot of my life. I would come home and I would tell my mother something like, oh no, you know, this terrible thing happened to me. And she says, Te un vaso de agua. And then she would tell me a more terrible story that happened to her, right? Or to a neighbor. So I was like, Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Probably my problem is not that big. <laughs> um, so I wanted to play with all the ways that we undrown, right? El desahogo is an undrowning but also how um, we use that as expression to not make a big deal of something that actually is quite small, even though it's quite big. Well, the interesting thing to me is with the saying, I have heard that before, going up on the Mexican border, the US-Mexican border. And to me, and perhaps I'm not understanding it correctly, it's almost like instead of despairing, you, you, you work through it. Mm -hmm. And it seems almost like Kara does that. Mm -hmm. And yes, she does unload the sauga of all the things that she's holding in, but she's not in despair, mm -hmm. which is very interesting because she has so much happening to her. Now, the format was really interesting. The job interview kind of format and... Uh, <laughs> I presume you decided before you wrote the book that you were going to go ahead and use that format and rather than write a regular, no, I don't mean regular, your usual novel. Well, you know, I initially, um, when I, before I knew this book was a novel, Cara Romero came to me um, in a moment that I was feeling despair. So <laughs> I was um, having a really difficult time selling my book, Dominicana. This was back in 2017. 
um, in a market that didn't, that kept telling me that um, there was no interest in this book um, for publication. And I thought, okay, well, do I really have to be a writer? What else can I do where I could be useful in the world? And at that time I was thinking maybe I'll study immigration law or do something more useful. Um, and I saw this woman on the platform on the subway in New York City and she looked like she was studying and she was much older than me. And I thought, oh, what must it look like, have been like to so many of the women in my family who were laid off in um, 2007 during the Great Recession. Um, a lot of factories had closed down and they never came back, right? And they were too young to retire, but kind of old enough to start over was like a really difficult thing. Um, many didn't speak the language and a, a, many did not know how to use the new technologies. So the way I started the book, it was like imagining what one of these women will, how they would respond to some of these common interview questions, like, what is your strength? You know, what are your weaknesses? What are your dreams? And Cara Romero came to me and was like, you wanna know something? And she just started talking. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna spend the year listening to Cara Romero asking her questions. So the book already had this monologue of this woman speaking to me. And in some ways, listening to her was helping me figure out what I wanted to do with my life. It was like my, my elder was counseling me, you know, and I was using writing as a way to access like what could be the next thing I would do in my life. And when I finally did receive a phone call from an editor, uh, you know, to buy the Minicana to publish it, they said, did, are you writing anything else? And I said, well, I'm working on this weird book, but it wasn't even a book. It was just lots of monologues of Cara Romero speaking to me. And I had to figure out, well, how do, what do I do with all this information? And I thought of these 12 counseling sessions that um, mirrored some of the programs that existed during the Great Recession for working class, um, late st older women in New York City. Well, as an older woman, <laughs> I loved the premise. Uh, there's not much written using older heroines mm -hmm. and uh, her struggles are very contemporary for many of us, even though it was in 2008. I mean, we just came through the pandemic. Many women are in her situation right now, still, mm -hmm. unfortunately. There, there's so much going on. <laughs> her getting back into the job market without technical skills that right now, for example, would be a big deal. Even then they were important. The thing with her son and the estrangement and I guess the, her reaction to his being homosexual was mm -hmm. a very interesting thread. And uh, there's so many themes in here. It, it's, it's kind of like there, there's, there's all these beautiful threads that, that are wonderful, motherhood, homophobia, the communities of women that you pull together that are her support system and that she's part of and she supports as well. The aging, poverty, uh, her self-reliance and survival because she's a survivor, it seems like. Is there at least one message that you are trying to get across to your readers? No. It's a wonderful I, I, I really, book. Yeah, there's so many issues that come up, right? And in some ways like, you know, I feel like what's exciting to me is that every reader, the responses I'm getting, they hold on to a different issue. They'll say, you know, I get a lot of letters from young people who are queer who'll say, oh my God, I'm, thank you for this book. Um, it made me feel less alone in my struggle and made me have more empathy for my mother. Um, I get letters or I'm told about like ways that the relationship between the sister, the sister who's really ambitious and wants to leave and Cara Romero who wants to hold on and not leave the neighborhood. Like that stress that we have of like, do we move on? Do we go or do we stay? Um, you know, spanking. <laughs> like some people who are dealing with children and, and figuring out how to discipline the ways we think modern disciplining kids versus the way that, you know, some of them were raised with these more traditional methods of disciplining their children and how there are consequences for that and that struggle where everyone thinks they're the good mother, they're making the right choices, 
Um, all these issues keep coming up for different people, but almost no one, it's like everyone just latches on to the thing that is feels closest to them. So for me, that's really um, cool, right? Um, if anything, if there was one thing that I feel like keeps coming back in the book over and over again, it's community and how important it is, right? These women would not survive if they didn't have each other. And I think that's a good message even during pandemic and post pandemic that what we understood in pandemic, when we were you know, alone trying to wrestle with everything that was happening, the people that did better were those that had, ha had stronger community networks to share resources, to keep each other um, healthy, um, my, mind, body, and soul. Um, I think those that didn't have strong community networks um, in proximity really, really suffered in different ways. Um, so I think like for me, the thing is, if it is, I, oh, I did receive a letter, I love this letter. I received a letter from a woman who had not read one novel in 20 years. She said, this is the first novel I've read in 20 years. Thank you so much. Maybe I'll read more. <laughs> and she said, as soon as I finished your book, I went and I took food to my neighbor. She said, we can all learn from Cara Romero. And I thought, okay, that is something I didn't think could happen from reading a book, but what a beautiful thing, right? Like that one gesture could catalyze a friendship or at least a network of, of care. Well, speaking as one of Las Comadres, I can tell you that, that there are communities of women and women seem to support each other. And the ones that don't have that community have a much harder time of it. So mm -hmm. you you have something there, obviously. It, it's important. I wish I wish everyone would read your book and understand that. I think it's a very um, I don't know if it's just if it's first generation or second generation uh, immigrants that that bring that to this country. But I grew up with communities of women that would help each other. One one. One scene, everybody that I talk to loves this one scene. I have to mention it and I wonder how you got this scene where the, the, um, the job coach is asking her, well, when are you available? And she says, I'm always available anytime except, and then she goes down this litany of her obligations where she's supporting everybody. And it, it's funny, but it's meaningful as well. How did you come up with that scene? It, it's so wonderful. Well, you know, I think that, you know, in some ways, like I grew up around multitaskers. And when I look, if, if I could try to make sense on how some people are able to do all the things they do, it does not make sense, right? Like, how is it that you're caring for your elders and your children and your grandchildren and the people you work with and showing up to jo your job, sometimes even studying, you know, side business, side hustles. You right. think, how do they do it? And I thought, you know, like, just to think about, um, like, in some ways, like, that is, you know, these are some of what, you know, the beauty about writing is that it also surprises you, and you never know how you arrive to something. But I do think, like, when I wrote that, I thought so much about how Cara Romero, she wants to work because she needs money, but she's always been working, right? She might be unemployed, but she's employed by her community except it's a job that doesn't pay. However, it has extreme value, right? Because if you have to pay for all that labor, all those people, they wouldn't be able to live the lives that they have. Her sister cannot save to buy a house and progress from poverty if she didn't have her sister taking care of her children for free, okay. right? And sometimes we really take for granted just how much free labor people in the community are doing so other people can go ahead and progress in the ways that we think progress is about having more money or having a house. And in some ways I wanted to center the real value of the ways that people care for each other. Is it that they bring you a little bit of breakfast in the morning? Or is it that they make sure to, you know, they walk your dog when you can't, like all the different ways that some people pay for that. You know what I mean? But in an interdependent community, in order for everyone to sort of like grow and progress, we all have to help each other. It's a beautiful theme. I wish everyone would understand that. Um, it's also an immigrant story. Is this a story of someone you know, or is this pretty much just, just something that 
happened, as you were saying, when you were trying to think of another book, because you seem to know her so well. I'm just wondering if, if it, this is based on a person. No, I mean, Cara Romero is truly a work of fiction. I, you know, to do the research for Dominicana, I spent a lot of time in the archives and interviewing a lot, a lot, a lot of people in my community, particularly women, but also men. And the stories we talked about, I'm really interested in labor and what people get paid and how they worked and how they survived. And I realized like those stories were very common. Like they, they had a lot of similar um, themes, right? And, um, and I thought in some ways, Cara Romero is kind of like the synthesized person from all those stories I heard, but just totally herself, right? Because what I wanted to do with Cara Romero is kind of say the things that nobody will say, right? To sort of, I mean, we live in a world that people really are careful about what they say. And I'm really excited about someone who's without filter and just says everything she says, right? Even if it's unpopular, even if it's difficult to hear. And through saying it, learns right? Like she'll say something and then someone will correct her. And then she's like, oh, I know I'm not supposed to say that. Okay. <laughs> but she's also learning, right? Like she starts, it's only 12 weeks, right? So it's not a long time, but she starts not understanding where her son left to understanding, right? Which is the most you can ask for any, from anyone. It's like to just spend some time reckoning with what you've done and thinking about how it impacted other people. Well, she is very insightful, but she reminds me of so many women that, that I've known over the years. And, and she's, you have an affection for her as a character. She's one of those characters that you just wanna, you just wanna help her if you can, you know? Or maybe it's because I'm an older woman. I don't know how other people feel, but most of the people that I've talked to that are comadres like I am, they recognize this woman and she speaks to them. But she's also funny as heck. She's she's charming. I love your use of, of language in Spanish as well. There's some words that I've not heard in years living in Austin. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm more assimilated than I thought I was, but, but it's so refreshing to have you use that language. You use it deliberately, do you not? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to write her as an English as a second language speaker, because I feel like that particular syntax is invisible in a lot of literature. Um, it's either that they're speaking in Spanish or they're speaking in English or they're speaking in Spanglish, right? But I was like, what if it's intentionally someone speaking English as ESL, right? Which makes up so much of the United States vocabulary. And then also thinking about how, so, I mean, I'm also an ESL, I'm an ESL, I'm a, you know, I'm not an ESL, but my first which although it was Spanish, my academic language is English, but I just started learning Italian 10 years ago. And when I was learning the new language, I make all of these mistakes that are very comical to the people who understand the language. And I think these mistakes, mistakes are also opportunities for us to think about how do we change the English language to hold everything that we are. Because yes, we are here in the US, right? Like many of us. But for someone like me, even though I was born and raised here, I lived concurrently with the dreams and nostalgia and imagination of my family that lives in Dominican Republic psychically and sometimes physically. And those two worlds don't always fit in the English language. They also need Spanish in it. So in some ways to think about the opportunity of like, flexing these two languages together to expand English for so we, can be part of it in a real way. Our experience could be part of it. Well, it works. It works beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> so let me ask, if you were to add, say, an addendum to the novel, if you had, if you were going to add another part of the story for Cara Romero, what would happen to her? And, and everybody wants to know, does she get the job? <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell. And I, I think that the beauty of the novel is that you continue the book, right? You, you've become so invested in this character that now you have an opportunity to imagine what will Kara do. But not only that, like one of the reasons the conversation is one-sided, and I only understood this later, is because we, the reader, are the interviewer. And if we could sit and think about 
every Cara Romero we meet and the opportunity that we have to listen to a Cara Romero in the world, right? Mm -hmm. What could the story be when we have the opportunity to support and listen and help a person like Cara Romero? We all have that opportunity. Every day we meet Cara Romero, so. Well, it, it was very interesting with seeing all the assessments that she had and, and all the skills that she had that were, there were people skills and she was innovative and she was caring and she did all this. And then the job that she, the jobs that she got were related to that. They were not high paying jobs, but they were very important and valuable jobs. And I think of, and I, I guess that was one of your intentions. There are so many Cara Romeros in the people run it, we run into that work in nursing homes or, or take care of your mom or dad when they're older. And, and they add so much value to your family because sometimes there are not communities available mm -hmm. of support service, you know, support people. And uh, I wish that your book was more commonly known by everybody because it's important for people to understand the immigrant story. And she's so hardworking and she's one of the best examples of a hardworking immigrant that, that I think you could write. Well, thank you for saying that. And I mean, I think that um, what's interesting about this particular book, the word of mouth has been very strong. Um, it's kind of amazing how many people read it and then want to gift it to someone to have a conversation, right? And I think that um, all of you who read it, if you tell someone about it, it will create a, an impact um, in a way. I mean, I think that um, readers keep books alive. If you like it, you keep talking about it, you make sure the bookstores have it. Um, but I do think that, you know, with the celebration during the pandemic of essential workers, it was like, I don't know what was going on in other parts of the country, but I could say in New York City, every day at seven o'clock, when people would be coming home from work, they would be clapping outside the windows and you would hear this wave of clapping all over the neighborhood um, when you know people were coming home, teachers and nurses and, and everyone was tipping like a lot of money to deliver. I mean, it was just like a moment where people were very, very, very grateful for essential workers because if it wasn't for them, especially in New York City where a lot of us could, you know, things had shut down and closed. Um, it was like weak, I don't know what would have happened, right? And in, you know, like people still had to show up and take care of the elders, the nursing homes, like they still had to do that work, you know? And in some ways, like, I feel like this book is right in, in the right moment in history because we were really celebrating the essential workers and then we forgot about them, right? There's some, in a way, like something has happened where the economy has shifted. And I feel like there's somehow a way that we're not talking, I mean, at least in the world I'm living in, it doesn't feel like they're at, there's not that much concern about their wellness. Mm -hmm. uh, when you see policy, when you see um, the kinds of ways government is, is behaving. So um, I'm hoping that the book sort of puts more pressure in thinking about what are the consequences of gentrification? What are the consequences of, you know, um, you know, not having social services or mental health support or all these other things that we really need um, to make sure our communities are okay? Well, Angie, one last question. Mm -hmm. Do you have another book on the horizon? I do, but I can't talk about it because what I just, it's like so many things at once. And this is the thing. It's so funny when you start a new book, you forget what it's like to write a book at all. It's so messy and frustrating. So I can't talk about it, but I do have a new book on the horizon. <laughs> I hope it doesn't take too long to get to print. Well, we'll see. Thank you so much for letting us speak with you. Thank you so much, Lydia. Have a great night. Gracias, comadres. Our second interview is with author Daniel Jose Oder. Daniel Jose Oder is a New York Times best-selling author and story architect. He has published 14 novels and numerous short stories and essays. 
and he is a regular comics writer for Star Wars, The High Republic Adventures, and Marvel. He won the International Latino Book Award and has been a finalist for the Kirkus Prize and the Mythopoeic Award, the Locus Award, the Andre Norton Award, and the World Fantasy Award. He and his wife and son live in New Orleans. Interviewing Daniel is Comadre Shirley Yanez a Guatemalan New Yorican, content creator, co-host of Geekets Chat, a book and movie review channel on YouTube, and Shirley and her sister Christy enjoy reading books, manga, watching movies, anime, and singing their hearts out at karaoke. Take it away, comadre Shirley. Uh, thank you, Karen. I hope you can all hear me. <laughs> um, this is exciting. I actually wanted to mention, uh, I wanted to say that I actually know about your Star Wars works. I read The Last Shot, a Han and Lando novel. So when I heard that I was going to actually interview you, read your book, uh, Ballad and Dagger, I was like, I was excited. And then getting to read it and actually falling in love with uh, Mateo and uh, Chela and Samadhi God and the community. So, and just bringing back memories of me growing up here in um, LES and the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. So thank you for uh, letting me, getting the opportunity to interview you and thank you for being here. Oh, that's, that's really wonderful to hear. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you enjoyed the book and I'm glad it felt like home a little bit because that, that was the idea. Yeah, no, definitely. So can you give us like a synopsis of Ballad and Dagger for people who haven't read it yet? Sure. So we um, we meet Mateo Matisse, who's this uh, 16 year old kid in Brooklyn, and he really just wants to play piano. He's kind of the local piano player for all of the, the whole community. And it, his community is falling apart. He's from this island, this magical imaginary island called San Madrigal, um, which sank a year after he was born. It just sank into the ocean and everybody ended up having to take out everything to Brooklyn, which is what you do when your island sinks. And the island itself was made up of Sephardic Jews, Santeros from Cuba, and pirates. And they all created this weird kind of culture that was mixed up with each other. And new gods and, and spirits and demons arose out of that culture. And they all ended up in Brooklyn too. And now Mateo has to face off with, with different demons and with his crush and find out his own magical legacy, which is as a healer and what that means in, in a time of war. Mm. yeah so going into that like world building I love it like you mentioning all the different like um like San Madrigal the founding groups of the uh, I think mm -hmm. it's uh, Safaraldim I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong thank you uh the Santeros and Pirates um yeah. and just that mixture of all these cultures and just like um I guess just surviving and, mm -hmm. and and respecting each other um where did you get the inspiration for those ideas i mean in a way it's it's brooklyn right but then in a bigger way it's everywhere right in another way it's cuba in another way it's puerto rico like that's just the history of the world is all these different um cultures coming together often very violently and and then often very harmoniously right and i think like so much of San Madrigal was about understanding that truth and then being able to be playful with it. Um, originally, this book was actually a middle grade novel. Um, and then it turned out that Rick Riordan's imprint uh, was ready to move into the young adult space. And so when they came to me with the idea of making it a young adult novel, it really changed what I felt like I would be able to accomplish with the book. And it made it much more expansive in terms of world building. So initially, I was really just gonna deal with Santeria, which is um, a culture that I'm an, an initiated priest in, and it's just part of who I am and my family. And, and then once I realized that I would have an opportunity to go even deeper than a middle grade and go all the way you know, into this much larger world that a, that a young adult book can encompass, I realized I, I really needed to be able to be more playful with the stories, with the mythology, with the deities. And even though it is a culture that I'm a part of, I still wasn't sure how to respectfully bring like the Orishas onto the page and not like do it a disservice. I don't think it's impossible to do, but I just didn't feel like 
the, the book was going to be ready for that. And so as part of that kind of conversation I was having with myself, I realized that I would have a lot more room to play and to expand and to change and, and do what I needed to do with the magic if I, if I, if I use uh, different cultures as kind of a baseline, but built from there and created something brand new that I, and new spirits that I would then be able to play with and get on the page very directly in a different way. So a lot of it came out of that, that open question. And then it became, okay, what, you know, what finding out that there is this whole history of Sephardic um, involvement in the Caribbean, including with pirates and including with um, the slave trade and all these different pieces of that. So that was really fascinating to learn. And then it really all just built from there and the pieces came together and I let them come together. And some of them I had to fuss with to get them to come together, but that was the journey. Yeah, and I love the map too in the beginning. Yeah. Like, it's like, oh, that's actually really cool. Cause it like, um, it, it like with books and why, why I love reading books, just sorry to go off in tangent, no, but please. It's like it, it, it takes you into that world. And so yes. when reading this, like I mentioned earlier, I just like remember growing up in my community. I still live here, but it's vastly gentrified. Um, exactly. It, there's nothing that reminds me really of my old community. Um, there's still people here struggling, trying to survive, especially with this economy and how <laughs> everything's expensive now in New York City. But, yeah. um, you know, I just remember how like if you hear music outside and we had Gucci Fritos and now you only could find that like in Harlem or stuff like right. that. And, yeah, you know, totally. So in this book, you you get that sense of culture, all these different cultures. And it just reminded me of that. And I was just like, wow, it made me nostalgic, but also like sad and bitter. Yeah, 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 totally. I mean, I think that's the, you know, that's the sorrow and the joy of, of the immigrant experience. And just, I think people of color in the United States in general, you know, just realizing that we're very displaceable and that truth, you know, I love what Angie was saying about it and, and how deeply it affects culture. And I think it's just been such a badly had conversation for so long. And a lot of my work is about trying to have the conversation with more honesty than I've seen it had in a lot of um, mainstream reporting and journalism and think pieces and, and in narrative too. Um, and it, I get it, like it's really complex. Gentrification is really hard to wrap our heads around. It is race, it is class, it is you know, levels of both of them. It is about privilege and, and ultimately, you know, it's a tragedy. Like no matter how many nice, um, you know, uh, organic grocery stores pop up, it doesn't change the fact that people are getting forcibly moved out of their home. And I think it's important to keep sight of it. And so, you know, this book is about culture and the power of it and the power of what it can do when people get together, but also the consequences of when people fall apart and, and don't find that unity. Yeah, that's true. Um, I connected with um, Mateo. Uh, he was a kid that like overthinks things, feels like he's not doing <laughs> right in his life feel yeah, like man. he doesn't belong within his community which mm -hmm. I feel because like I don't sp I understand Spanish but I don't speak it well sure and sure with my Guatemalan family my Puerto Rican family it's always like should I even try I would like I don't know I feel like I'm getting judged so I just like I just love Mateo I was just feeling wow, thank you um so where did the character inspiration came like came from from like you or your family or somebody you knew or anything like that yeah, it's a lot of different pieces with Mateo. Like every character I think of is like a gumbo, you know, like there's just all these different parts that we put in and some of them are us, some of them come out of thin air, some of them are friends, you know, so it's all of that. Um, he's a musician, which I am too. He's a much better musician than I am. Um, he really lives it and breathes it. And for me, it's sort of like something I love, but do on the side. And uh, so, you know, he, he's that, <laughs> he's taller than me. Uh, <laughs> But, um, but certainly his arc in terms of like understanding himself within his community is definitely something that, that's very personal to me. And at the same time, something I've also witnessed in other people. I always think about that um, James Baldwin quote where he says, you think you're all alone with your pain and you're suffering until you open a book, right? And like, that's so true. It's also true of like, when you, when you reconnect to your people or you connect to your people, you have conversations. And that's the power of literature, but that's also the power of community. Um, again, shout out to Angie and speaking about that because that's so fundamental to, to I think our work as Latinos is like realizing and, and 
uh, put in story to the power of community because so many books don't do that. And, you know, so I think like it is in books and that is important and it is also in speaking to people. And so for me, it was like thinking that whatever pecu peculiarity of my own upbringing made me different. And it just took a conversation with or a lot of conversations to realize like everyone, so many people have that feeling of being an outsider, but also belonging at the same time. And that's a very particular kind of heartache, but it's also a very common one. And we don't know that because it feels so private that we don't often talk about it, right? Like we, we think we got to keep it to ourselves because whatever, it's embarrassing or who knows what. And then we talk about it, it's like, oh man, I felt that way too, but because of XYZ and because of 397 or whatever, you know, and, and that's so powerful, you know? So it was a lot of my own experience and emotional journey. And it was also like listening to other people who had similar stories or stories that, you know, were in parallel, but then verged off here or there. And that was the most gratifying part of the book was kind of like finding an arc for those different stories and, and even seeing how like Chela is a very different person in the community than Mateo, but also feels a sense of alienation too. And how do they, how does that become a love story? Um, so all those pieces were the ones I, I had them on the table. And then when you write a book, you're kind of like, it's almost like a puzzle, but it doesn't have a set answer. So you're moving the pieces around and trying to figure out which way it works and which does it. And you just keep playing with it and playing with it. And you're like, that's it. That's what it is. Yeah, and I think it talks about like, um, in a sense, like generational trauma and like yeah. lies and betrayal and just like the the kids, the teenagers feel like oh, these adults are lying to us. They're holding like stuff back, and so it's like it happens a lot. <laughs> it does. It does. It does, especially in and in, in Latin like communities and families and stuff. Yeah. So I, I definitely felt that <laughs> truly. Um, which one is your favorite character? Um, Mateo is the closest to my heart for sure for all the reasons I described I really love Chela though like I think she um, I was uh, like it's always a concern I think it should always be a forefront of your brain as a male writer when you're writing a, a woman character especially a love interest that she not become just a love interest you know or just a femme fatale or just like someone who's there to get murdered or murder for the sake of the hero doing what he has to do that's always the danger so especially when you know, this character, this book is really from Mateo's, is entirely from Mateo's point of view. So we don't get to be in Chela's head at all. And that makes it even more um, necessary and urgent, I think, to make sure that Chela had a fully formed arc and we really got a sense of who she was as a human being, not just in terms of her attractiveness to Mateo. So that felt like the challenge that I was really setting out with. And I do, I do feel like, at least in my own mind, like she really did come to life and become someone who is holy herself and not just a person in relationship to him. And I, I love her arc and her journey, you know, and her badassness, but also her ability, to, her vulnerability. You know, I think all those things are kind of where Chela stands at the crossroads. And so when her and Mateo do really start to get to know each other, it feels right uh, and not forced. And, and so I felt that as I was writing, like, okay, this makes sense, you know, because sometimes you're writing and you're like, let me put these two characters in a room together and they don't connect. And then you're like, oh no, this was my love interest. What do I do, right? Like, but that's not what happened. Then God, you know, they had their chemistry, and it does feel like God. You know, it does feel like it's kind of a magic thing. Like you can't really. It's just like in life, like you can't. There's no um, mathematical equation that gets you chemistry. It's just like it's there or it's not or whatever. And so that's also true in books. So I was like, oh boy, we're gonna see what happens. But it worked out. <laughs> no, they had great chemistry. And thank you, Chella, The thing is, like, she's she's tough she's like you know she you know does stuff that you're like okay <laughs> she's a warrior but um she can be vulnerable too and also be you know have chemistry with the main um love interest and, and you know character and, and sadly a lot happens now that uh uh female characters are just like oh they can only be like the tough type and they can't right. find like uh be right. low and stuff they can't be complex which exactly. i'm not saying you don't need you need a man or, or a love interest or whoever you know a partner mm -hmm. or a woman or stuff but you know it you know people have complexities and women do as well so exactly. uh, so thank you for that for cello because she's great she was great okay. um so it was very fascinating when you brought up that Samadriga was never colonized, but colorism still plays a part in Samadriga, where people with light skin tones 
hold much of the power in the community, which is sadly true in our society. Um, yeah. Why was it important to have that aspect in your story? Uh, that's a number of things. Mostly it's just because it's true. You know, like you said, I think um, we it's true across the board. Uh, you know, anti-Blackness is, is international. It's a global phenomenon. And it's very clear where it comes from. And I think we have to deal with that. But I think with San Madrigal specifically too, it was very much about looking at uh, particularly like left-wing communities, like uh, looking at my own communities, radical communities, um, looking at Cuba, uh, places that believe themselves to be kind of outside of the problems of empire, but aren't. And I think that's such an important conversation to have because the second you think you're outside it is the second you do the most damage really, you know, and like um, that can be very, um, just it can just be an end to the conversation to sort of believe that you're above it because you are you have positioned yourself in opposition to something as big and powerful as empire and that's not to say that that's not important like we we do need those voices we do need um anti-imperial work um but it doesn't come at it doesn't come with the grace of like then being able to enact all the other isms that are going on because of empire so you know there's tremendous amounts of, of racism in a place like cuba but because of the dynamic of the revolution and everything else, it can be very hard to talk about and deal with. And it's the same thing in a lot of leftist spaces in the US. Um, but that's where we have to deal with them. We have to deal with them in our own houses first and understand what that means. You know? And there's a tremendous amounts of anti-Blackness in Latino communities, and we have to deal with that. And they're still in, uh, very often it's the same communities that are in opposition or just trying to get by you know, in a system that doesn't like them, right? But that doesn't cancel out the anti-blackness so it's about being able to have those conversations and they're hard they're ugly you know they're complicated but just like with history just like the way that we can't pretend that you know colonialism doesn't have an ugly history we also have to deal with the things that are going on right now and that's really what that was about mm. well yeah and you know you see that in like when i go visit like guatemala and then there's the anti-indigenous exactly that happens a lot over there and the anti-blackness as well as well and so mm -hmm. it's, like, it's propaganda it's like society mm -hmm. media all this like and and kids sadly grow up with that if they have family or they see that so yeah it's definitely something we have to fight back against um so um the anti-blackness and anti-indigenous but mm -hmm. so yeah thank you for bringing that up um, since writing for Star Wars Universe or bringing representation to the forefront, how do you feel about bringing that representation to your own series? And if there's anything you wish to do more within your upcoming books dealing with representation? I mean, representation to me is just like, it's the world, you know what I mean? Like, it's, I, 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 it's, it's just like you're being honest about the world around you. And like, on the one hand, it's become very politicized, like people have really politicized it by being so offended by the existence of anyone who's not white in media It just becomes this like flashpoint where all their feelings are hurt, and they have to scream about it online. And then we have to deal with the articles about it, you know, it's a cycle, you know what I mean? And like, that's, um, that's where I think the like, the dynamic is, is really toxic. Um, but the, the simple act of like putting a queer character or a black character in Star Wars, that seems just really basic. Like that's, of course you would, right? Because Star Wars is a reflection of this world, even if it's a galaxy far, far away. And this world has queer folks and black folks. So why, why wouldn't they be in Star Wars, right? It's like super um, basic, but then it becomes really tumultuous because of, you know, uh, online uh, chaos <laughs> and uh, targeted chaos. So I just think of it as natural and I'm just writing the world as I know it to be. Um, and unfortunately, that becomes making a political point, which I'm, you know, I, if that's what it, if that's what I'm doing, then that's what I'm doing. Um, but I don't consider it political to just have the world be reflected in the work, if you know yeah. what I mean. No, definitely. Yeah. I mean, like you said, everyone's different. <laughs> like yeah. that's just showing reality, basically. Even though it's in, exactly, it's still that's still our world in a sense. You know, people. Yeah. Want reflections of themselves why shouldn't they you know exactly oh, that's very important um since this is book one of the outlaw saints novel can you give us mm -hmm. like a sneak peek of what's next for my thing? sure 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 yeah so this is a duology meaning that the next book is the last book in the series and it closes out the 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 arc of of this 
mythology. Um, it's called The Last Canto of the Dead, mm. which uh, I'm really excited about as a title because it, it fits perfectly with what the story is. I can tell you that it starts like literally a couple seconds after book one ends. Mm. And if you've read book one, you know what that means, where they're headed to and what that entails. And then the last thing I'll say about it is that it has multiple points of view, unlike book one. It has two different narrators. Uh, so we get to follow someone else besides Mateo, which allowed me to really expand on the storytelling and the world building, which was really fun. And um, yeah, I mean, it was a, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it was a really hard book to write. It was very, very challenging. Um, not in the sense of like, I didn't know if I would finish it. It was always, I, knew, I always knew I was gonna finish it and I knew, more or less what would happen. It's not like I was getting stuck with about what should happen next. It was just uh, grueling kind of emotionally, in part because we were going through, you know, the pandemic and a number of other world ending situations. And then partly just because the characters really do go through it in a big way. And they have a lot to kind of get, get past to get where they need to go. And uh, sometimes you just empath with your characters. So I was feeling a lot of what they were feeling. And I was like, woo, man, this is a lot. You know, like, I don't know if we're gonna make it. So <laughs> I, str I struggled with it in a good way. Like it was always, it wasn't like, it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't struggling. Like, I don't know if I'm gonna get the book done. It was just like, oh, it was, it was a, it was a lot to, to write. And I'm glad I did. And, and I'm glad it's as dark as it is uh, because that's the story that wanted to be told. Mm. Um, actually, I forgot to ask this question. It is mm -hmm. the last question. When San Madrigal disappears in the Caribbean, the uh, diaspora moves to Brooklyn, which is, of course, very big diaspora. You know, uh, communities move to the United States and different places. Is Brooklyn an important place for you? And why did you use it as a setting? Mm -hmm. I do. I love Brooklyn a lot. I lived there for 14 years, and it's really where I became a writer um and and then also where I wasn't I was an organizer when I lived there and I was a paramedic when I lived there and all those things bring you very close to the streets of the city that you're in you know like there's jobs where you spend all your time up in a skyscraper and there's jobs where you're right there on the street level and then there's jobs like being a medic where you are those places and everywhere else in between and so it's a place I just feel very intimately connected to um a lot of my closest friends still live there and family members and got family and so it's just in my heart and this story felt very Brooklyn um some stories aren't some stories can be moved you know and that's what they are but this one because of, of the particular blend of immigrants in I was really thinking about um this, this area right geographically speaking right where San Madrigal is uh right where Little Madrigal is in Brooklyn there's a there's a community that's a lot of Ecuadorians and Dominicans, and it's kind of right on the edge of Brooklyn and Queens. And it's such a beautiful place. Like I worked there on the ambulance for a long time and I loved it. And it always just felt very like, even though uh, like I was just coming there for work, it always felt like it embraced me. Um, and they, the food is amazing and the music is fantastic, you know? So uh, I love it there. And, and I worked there as an organizer too. And um, I, kind of, I kind of wanted to honor that place and also be able to, just like with the conversation about Santeria, where I needed to, I knew I needed to kind of expand into an imaginary realm. The same is true of that neighborhood where I didn't want to be beholden to the actual physicality of each store, of each community exactly. So it really required, the book really demanded that something new come up and be kind of squeezed into that big, wonderful mess of, of cultures. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, Daniel. This was amazing. And it was amazing. So, yeah, I'm excited for your next one. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. No, no, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
We learned so much from your questions. Thank you, thank you for doing, for, for your attention to the detail and the way you interacted so beautifully with our authors. We thank our audience for taking the time to join us tonight and those who submitted questions, thank you. Also thanks to all our volunteers without whom our book club and all the associated work would not happen. Mil gracias. Please remember to support our authors by writing a review of their books on sites like Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes and Noble, and others. Those reviews carry weight with the publishers as well as with other readers. Buy a book to support our authors. And if your library doesn't have a book that you wanna read, ask them to order it. It makes a difference. And please attend your virtual local book club meetings and bring a friend or two. Remember, our book club is open to men and women, Latinos and non-Latinos, all are welcome. Our January 2023 books are 2023. Boy, I stumbled on that one. A Woman of Light by Kale Fah Kali Fajardo Anstein, Murder in Red, Hook by Teresa Varela. <clears throat> Again, thank you all for your continued support of our book club and Latino literature. Please join us in celebrating our quinceañera throughout the year by buying books and supporting Latino authors. To all of you, happy holidays, Feliz Navidad, and everything that that means, and read Latino literature. Good night. Thank, thank you, everyone. Good night.